What if Order 66 didn't work? What would happen then? Let's find out. So in this timeline, a few things would be different in how the clone army was created. In the original timeline, Sifo Dyas ordered the clone army after he had visions of a war that would soon arrive. This war, of course, was the Clone Wars. But the Jedi High Council ignored Sifo Dyas and his visions. And so, the Jedi Master took it upon himself to create an army for the Republic. And that is why Sifo Dyas went to the Kaminoans and ordered an army for the Republic. And it was also Sifo Dyas that initially provided the inhibitor chips to be implanted into the clones. But it is important to note that the chips that Sifo Dyas gave the Kaminoans were designed as a safeguard against rogue Jedi, Pong Krell for example, and not as a means to eliminate every single Jedi in the galaxy. But in the original timeline, Dooku found out about Sifo Dyas creating the clone army and took over the project after having Sifo Dyas killed by the Pike Syndicate. And following this, Dooku had the original inhibitor chips provided by Sifo Dyas modified to make it so that the clones can be forced to kill every single Jedi upon receiving Order 66. This is what happened in the original timeline, but in this new alternate timeline, a few things would go very wrong for Dooku and Palpatine. So you see, even in the original timeline, the Kaminoans always believed that Dooku was also a Jedi, and they did not know that the inhibitor chips could be used to purge the Jedi from the galaxy. This is evident when the incident with Hives happens and Dooku directly contacts the Kaminoans, telling them that the inhibitor chips are a safeguard that must remain a secret as the secrecy is necessary to keep any rogue Jedi from finding out about the chips. And when this meeting with Dooku ended, the Kaminoans remarked that the Jedi are a strange cult. So they always believed that Dooku was another Jedi and wanted what was best for the Republic and the Jedi Order. And this belief is what ends up causing a problem in this alternate timeline. And that is because in this alternate timeline, to make the clones better serve the Jedi, the Kaminoans added a few modifications of their own besides the modifications that the inhibitor chips introduce in the clones. So side note, the Kaminoans did this in the original timeline as well, but in this timeline, Lamasu, the Prime Minister of Kamino, decided to go a little further than they did in the original timeline. So anyways, these Kaminoan modifications were carefully woven into the fabric of the clones' brains during their development process. The Kaminoans' objective with this was to instill in the clones an unwavering loyalty to the Galactic Republic and the Jedi Order, believing that Dooku, who they mistakenly thought to be a Jedi with noble intentions, saw the same outcome. And these modifications, to be specific, involved a series of behavioral protocols aimed at enhancing discipline, preventing desertion, and ensuring a level of dedication that bordered on the fanatical. And one of these modifications that the Kaminoans introduced that would cause problems for Palpatine later on could have been termed as an anti-mutiny protocol. So basically, this protocol was designed to distinguish between legitimate commands and those that would lead to the betrayal of the Republic's core principles, represented by the Jedi. It worked on a simple yet effective premise. If a Jedi had not displayed any signs of disloyalty or behavior to indicate a rogue status, the clones would be physically incapable of acting against them, even under direct orders to do so. If the superior officers who control the clones for whatever reason tried to turn the clones against the Jedi, the clones must be able to see through that. This was the Kaminoans' reasoning behind this protocol, and at the end of the day, it was the Jedi who ordered the army and the Kaminoans wanted to make sure that the Jedi would not regret their purchase. Also, this protocol did not, however, impair the clones' ability to deal with genuinely rogue Jedi. The Kaminoans had developed a nuanced understanding of the Jedi ethics and behaviors, and essentially programmed the clones with a sophisticated decision-making process. This process involved real-time evaluation of a Jedi's actions against the Republic and the Jedi Order's core values. If a Jedi deviated significantly from these values, displaying clear signs of betrayal or malevolence, the protocol allowed the clones to proceed with actions against these rogue Jedi, bypassing the anti-mutiny safeguard. This distinction, at least as the Kaminoan saw it, ensured the clones remained effective guardians of the Republic, able to act decisively against any threat from within without being hamstrung by their programming when faced with genuine treachery. And also, the Kaminoans did not disclose the specifics of all these modifications to Dooku, as they assumed that these enhancements would further endear the clones to the Jedi. In their eyes, Dooku, as a Jedi, would naturally appreciate any effort to align the clone army more closely with the Jedi's protective role over the Republic. And Dooku, for his part, harbored an unwavering confidence in the design of the inhibitor chips and their ability to compel the clones 
to execute R66, irrespective of any secondary conditioning the clones may have received. Dooku's focus remained on the broader strategy of the Sith, underestimating the Kaminoans' initiative and the depth of their loyalty to their customers, which were, as they saw it, the Jedi. This oversight was a critical miscalculation, rooted in Dooku's belief in the infallibility of Sith planning and the Kaminoans' misunderstanding of Dooku's true allegiance. So basically, in this timeline, the Kaminoans, through their ingenuity, had essentially embedded a failsafe within the clones, an ethical firewall that prevented them from turning on the Jedi unless there was undeniable evidence of betrayal to the Republic. And now, with all that being said, let us turn our attention to the moment Order 66 was executed in this timeline. Also, everything else in this timeline up to Palpatine executing Order 66 would have remained the same, except for the incident with Fives, as due to the behavioral modifications, Tap's failing inhibitor chip would not have caused him to kill a Jedi, but it would have caused Tap to execute himself, as in his mind, he had become a traitor, and as per the anti-mutiny protocol, traitors had to be dealt with in the most effective and efficient manner, which in most cases meant destroying them. Anyways, coming back to the story, in this timeline as well, after Anakin helped get rid of Master Windu, Palpatine would prepare to execute Order 66. And so, as the galaxy stood on the brink of monumental change, Palpatine sent out a recorded holo transmission to every single clone trooper, telling them to execute Order 66, confident that the Jedi will soon be no more. This command, intended as the final stroke of his grand scheme, instead initiated a catastrophic internal conflict within the clone troopers. Palpatine saw this failure firsthand when he directly contacted Cody to make sure that Obi-Wan was killed. Commander Cody, the time has come. Execute Order 66, Palpatine told the commander. But upon receiving this order, Cody's expected compliance was absent. Instead, a visible struggle manifested. A war of wills taking place within the clone as the anti-mutiny protocol clashed violently with the directives of Order 66. And because of this, in the moment that should have sealed Obi-Wan's fate, confusion reigned. Cody, alongside his brethren who had also received the order, albeit indirectly, found themselves ensnared in an internal battle. The clones had fought side by side with the Jedi, witnessing their dedication to the Republic firsthand. The command to execute such allies contradicted every principle that they had been conditioned to uphold in this timeline. For Cody, the dissonance was unbearable. The Kaminoan modifications, deeply embedded within his psyche, screamed against the actions he was being compelled to undertake. And Palpatine, observing all this from afar, anticipated swift compliance. Instead, he was met with an eerie silence, then shock as Cody, in a harrowing decision, turned his blaster upon himself. This happened because the Chancellor's command had inadvertently branded Cody as a traitor in his own mind. And as per the anti-mutiny protocol, Cody was forced to eliminate the perceived threat to the Republic, even if it meant self-destruction. And this tragic scene unfolded across battlefields galaxy-wide as many clones succumbed to the same fate, their loyalty to the Jedi and the Republic proving stronger than the sinister intent of Order 66. Obi-Wan Kenobi, who by this point had defeated General Grievous, witnessed in horror the collapse of the clone troopers around him. But not all clones were overcome by their programming. A small number of them had their inhibitor chips assert control, momentarily turning on the Jedi commanders, yet this betrayal was short-lived as these compromised clones were quickly neutralized by their fellow soldiers who recognized them as traitors, following which these clones destroyed themselves as well, as they too were traitors, according to the anti-mutiny protocol. And as for Palpatine, as he was, Order 66, his grand plan, failed. But he was prepared for something like this. Meanwhile, as Anakin Skywalker was approaching the 501st Legion, ready to march on the Jedi Temple, he was unaware of the unfolding chaos resulting from Order 66. His mind was consumed with fulfilling Palpatine's directive, which was eradicating the Jedi under the guise of a twisted sense of justice. However, at the moment Anakin arrived to marshal the clones, Anakin was also met with a scene of clone self-destruction. In this turmoil, Anakin's thoughts raced, doubt and confusion clouding his mind. The possibility that Palpatine had somehow deceived him flickered through his thoughts, but he pushed this aside and began making his way back into the Chancellor's office. And soon after, bursting back into Palpatine's office, Anakin's appearance was wild, his demeanor frantic. What have you done? He demanded of Sidious, seeking answers for the catastrophic failure of Order 66. Palpatine, though taken aback by the situation's deviation from his meticulous plan, retained his composure. Something has gone terribly wrong, Lord Vader, he admitted. 
a rare crack in his usual unflappable demeanor showing. Citizen quickly surmised that their position on Coruscant was untenable. The Jedi would soon piece together the attempted coup and retaliate. And having said this, Sidious saw confusion build up within Anakin. And seeing as how he needed Anakin to leave Coruscant with him, Sidious said the following, If we do not leave now, the Jedi will undoubtedly kill us. And then, what of Padme, your wishes, they would become true. You will fail in protecting your wife, Sidious said, manipulating Anakin's threat of losing Padme. These words struck a chord with Anakin, Anakin's tormented visions flashing before his eyes. We must leave now, Lord Beta, Sidious reiterated. And then, Anakin made a decision. If he died at the hands of the Jedi, like Sidious said, then there would be no one left to save Padme. And so, with turmoil swelling within him, Anakin followed Palpatine into his personal shuttle. And as they ascended away from the planet, Coruscant became a diminishing speck, symbolizing the life and allegiance Anakin was leaving behind. And upon leaving Coruscant, Palpatine was already formulating his next move. The Sith Lord, with his foresight and contingency plans, refused to let this setback of a failed Order 66 deter him. With the clone troopers effectively neutralized by their own protective programming against the Jedi, the Republic's military might was severely crippled, if not completely destroyed. This unforeseen twist necessitated a pivot in strategy, compelling Palpatine to adapt to the changing circumstances. Palpatine's immediate plan upon leaving Coruscant involved relocating his base of operations to Sereno, which was a world already steeped in significance due to its association with Count Dooku, Palpatine's erstwhile apprentice. Sereno, with its strategic importance and resources, would serve as an ideal stronghold from which to command the vast armies of the Separatists. So, since Palpatine was playing both sides of the war, he also indirectly controlled the Separatist droid forces, along with the Republic clone forces. With the clones now gone, Palpatine alters his plan and decides to lead the Separatist army to take over the galaxy and make himself the Emperor. With the clones gone and the Jedi few in number, Palpatine believed that victory would soon be his in spite of the setback that was Order 66. Meanwhile, back on Coruscant in the aftermath of Order 66 unforeseen failure, the Jedi Temple became a beacon of confusion and despair for many returning Jedi. Among them were Obi-Wan Kenobi, returning from Utapau after his victory over General Grievous, and Ahsoka Tano, fresh from her triumph in Mandalore, where she has successfully defeated Maul and taken him prisoner. The Jedi Temple on Coruscant, usually a place of peace and contemplation, was subbuzz with an uneasy energy as the seasoned warriors joined their brethren in trying to piece together the catastrophic events that had unfolded galaxy-wide. And to address all this confusion in the air, an emergency session of the Jedi Council was convened. Ahsoka was also present in this meeting, despite not being a council member or even a Jedi at this point. This is because she had information about Maul that the Jedi Council was keen to know about. Anyways, once the meeting began, Shaq Di took the lead in recounting the recent events, as she was on Coruscant when everything went down. Master Windu, Saisi Tin, Aiden Kolar, and Kit Fisto, Shakti began her voice steady despite the tremor of emotions beneath. Windu confronted Arthur Palpatine after Anakin revealed his true identity as Darth Sidious. The council chamber fell into a deep silence as Shakti continued. What transpired in the Chancellor's office remains a mystery, but the outcome was the gravest possible. Master Windu and the others did not survive, and Skywalker and Sidious have disappeared. And as for what happened to the clones, we recovered a holo transmission that had been sent to them right before the incident. Shakti then activated a holo projector to display this message that the clones had received, following which, the image of a heavily disfigured Palpatine flickered to life. Execute Order 66, Palpatine said in the holo transmission. Shakti then deactivated the holo projector and talked about how Order 66, according to the Kaminoans, was designed to allow the clones to act against rogue Jedi. Shakti then summarized that Palpatine had most likely tried to somehow use this against the Jedi Order to destroy them, but that the Kaminoans' conditioning prevented the clones from performing such an action against innocent Jedi. This made sense to the Council, especially given how, in Season 6 of the Clone Wars, it was revealed to them that Count Dooku did have an involvement with the creation of the Clone Army. As for why the Clone Forces turned on themselves, we all need more time to figure out exactly what happened, Shakti added, before ending what she had to say. The Council absorbed this information with a mixture of shock and sorrow. The reality that the clones, their trusted allies, had turned on themselves in a failed attempt to carry out Palpatine's orders only added to the confusion and despair. And as for Obi-Wan, grappling with the loss of Mace Windu and the others, coupled with the disappearance of Anakin and the betrayal they had all experienced, tried to make sense of the chaos. Anakin must have gone after Sidious. I am certain soon he will contact us with what is happening. 
Obi-Wan said, not entirely trusting his words. And at this point, Ahsoka, sitting among the council, despite her departure from the Order, felt a pressing need to share what she had learned from Maul. With Anakin's sudden disappearance, she believed that maybe what Maul said would help them find Anakin. Maul told me something on Mandalore, Ahsoka began, her voice firm with the resolve to deliver her message. He told me that Anakin has been manipulated for years to become Sidious's apprentice. With the revelation that Sidious is Palpatine, it's possible that Anakin is somehow under the control of Sidious. She then paused, looking around the faces of her former mentors and friends, all marked with varying degrees of shock and realization. But, as she continued, emphasizing her next words carefully, we must remember that Sidious is manipulating Anakin. He is not himself. Obi-Wan, upon hearing Ahsoka's words, felt a profound sense of dread, mixed with understanding. It cannot be. Maul must be lying. It was Anakin who alerted the Jedi to Palpatine being Sidious. Why would he do that if he was in league with Sidious? Was Anakin trying to set a trap for Master Windu to help Sidious? Obi-Wan's thoughts were going to places he didn't want them to go, so he stopped thinking about them. And the Council, now faced with the dual task of unraveling the mystery of what happened in the Chancellor's office and dealing with the aftermath of Order 66, recognized the urgency of the situation. The realization that Anakin Skywalker, the Chosen One, the Hero of the Republic, might be entwined with the darkest threat the galaxy had faced in a millennia was a bitter pill to swallow. Yoda, silent up until this point, finally spoke, his voice resonating with the wisdom of centuries clouded the future race, but clear our path must be. Protect the Republic and find the truth we must. Skywalker, lost he may seem. To save him, we will try. Trust in the Force, we must, Yoda said. After the meeting ended, in the dimly lit corridors of the Jedi Temple, Obi-Wan Kenobi and Ahsoka Tano walked side by side, each lost in their own tumultuous thoughts. The bait of the galaxy's fate seemed to press down upon them, yet it was the fate of one man, Anakin Skywalker, that dominated their conversation. I've been thinking about what you said, Ahsoka, about Anakin being manipulated by Palpatine. At first I couldn't, wouldn't believe it. Anakin is like a brother to me, but the more I think about it, the more I see. The signs were there. The doubt, the fear, the anger. Palpatine has been manipulating him, hasn't he? Obi-Wan asked, both to Ahsoka and himself. Hearing this, Ahsoka stopped walking, turning to face Obi-Wan. I wish it weren't true, Master. Maul's words, Anakin's disappearance with Palpatine, it does seem likely that Anakin, for some reason, might be aiding Palpatine. I don't sense Anakin is in the Cosmic Force. He is alive, I know that, Ahsoka said. Obi-Wan nodded, pain etched into his features. Then we must act quickly. If Anakin is under Palpatine's way, who knows what further harm he could bring. The two then resumed walking. The silence between them filled with unspoken fears. And after a moment, Ahsoka spoke up. Master, how can we possibly find Anakin? Palpatine has likely taken him to a place we cannot easily reach. And Anakin, he might not want to be found. That's true, Obi-Wan acknowledged. But we have something that Palpatine may not have considered. Ahsoka looked at him, questioningly. Padme, Obi-Wan said softly. If there's any part of the Anakin that we knew still within him, any part that Palpatine hasn't corrupted, it's his love for Padme. She might be able to lead us to him, Obi-Wan said. Meanwhile, on the distant world of Sereno, Darth Sidious, formerly Chancellor Palpatine, wasted no time in consolidating his power. The grand plan he had so meticulously woven had encountered an unforeseen snag with the failure of Order 66. Yet his ambitions and overall plan remained undeterred. From Kavanduku's former Chancellor of Sereno, Sidious took full command of the Separatist droid army, a vast and unfeeling legion that would now serve as an instrument of his will. Also, in this new timeline, like in the original timeline, the Separatist leaders were still alive and well on Mustafar, awaiting further instructions from Sidious. And Sidious's control over these leaders remained absolute, their lives hanging on his every word. A testament to Sidious's manipulative mastery and strategic foresight. However, Anakin Skywalker, now standing by Sidious's side, found himself increasingly detached from the conflict and all the political machinations. His thoughts were consumed by Padme and the haunting premonitions of her demise. Anakin's initial resolve, when he turned against Master Windu, fueled by desperation and fear, had led him to embrace a path he believed could save her. Yet, as the dust settled and Anakin's mental state was returning to some resemblance of normalcy, he found himself free from the immediate influence of Palpatine's presence and doubts began to seep in. How will we say, Palme? You promised me the power to prevent her death, Anakin asked Sidious. And Sidious, ever the manipulator, sensed the burgeoning uncertainty within Anakin. Patience, my apprentice. 
he counseled Anakin with a veneer of benevolence. The secrets to saving your wife are within our grasp. But first, we must eliminate the Jedi. They would never allow us to harness the necessary powers. They are the only ones standing in our way now. Hearing this, Anakin, now not as consumed by the raw emotions that had clouded his judgment while the train was into, found himself grappling with a critical reassessment of his choices. The seeds of doubt were planted firmly in his mind. Could Palpatine's promises truly be trusted? The more Anakin pondered, the more he realized how much he had already sacrificed at the altar of these promises. The thought that Palpatine might be lying was unbearable, not a possibility Anakin was willing to entertain, yet he couldn't shake the nagging doubt. And then later, determined to hold on to something real amidst the chaos, Anakin reached out to Padme through a secure communication line, one he believed couldn't be tracked. The connection was quickly established, and for the moment, all the turmoil seemed to fade away as they shared their concern for each other. Padme, are you alright? Anakin's voice was fraught with worry. I am, Anakin, but what about you? What's happening? Where are you? There were reports that you were killed, disappeared. I'm... I'm working on something. Something to save you. Padme, I promise. I'll find a way. Anakin interjected, assuring Padme, his voice firm with determination. And Padme, though she did not have the aid of the Force, could still sense Anakin's turmoil. His devotion, though born from a place of love, brought a guilt within Padme. She knew of the clone trooper's self-destruction and also that Anakin had somehow mysteriously disappeared with Chancellor Palpatine after a four Jedi that went to arrest Palpatine for committing treason was found dead. This was all over the holonet and Padme knew of this. And now, having figured that Anakin was alive and well and was doing all this to save her, Padme began to wonder if Anakin, blighted by his love for her, had inadvertently done something that is now contributing to the Republic's downfall. These thoughts turned within Padme. Yet she remained silent about her fears. Padme then asked Anakin where exactly he was, and Anakin, completely trusting his wife, took a leap of faith. Padme, come to Sereno. It's where I am now. It's the only place where you'll be safe from what I've seen in my visions, Anakin said. And after a moment's hesitation, filled with conflicting emotions, Padme agreed. And a short while after, Anakin ended the transmission, telling Padme that he will be waiting for her. And when the transmission ended, Padme again delved into her thoughts. Anakin was on Sereno, a separatist system, and he has gone there with Palpatine after four Jedi mysteriously died in the Chancellor's office. What is Anakin doing, she wondered. She felt that Anakin was in trouble, and moreover, she believed that this was happening due to Anakin's love for her. So she began, in many ways, blaming herself for what was happening. And then, as Padme's mind was going through all this, a quiet hum of a speeder broke through her contemplation. And looking out, she saw Ahsoka and Obi-Wan disembarking, their presence a surprise, yet somehow a solace in these tumultuous times. And without wasting a moment on pleasantries, Obi-Wan and Ahsoka got straight to the point. Padme, Anakin is in grave danger, Obi-Wan began, his voice changed with urgency. We believe he is under the influence of the Sith, Sidious, who has even covered his none other than Palpatine. Padme was aware of Palpatine's supposed betrayal through the hole in it, but she was not acutely aware of Palpatine also being a Sith. An ancient enemy of the Jedi, as Anakin had once told her. And following what Obi-Wan said, Ahsoka added the following. The tragedy with the clones, it was Palpatine's failed attempt to destroy the Jedi. But Anakin, he's been misled, Padme, caught in Palpatine's web of lies. We need to save him. You might be the only one that could help us do that, Ahsoka said. Do you know where he is, Padme? Obi-Wan then asked. So in the original timeline, the reason why Padme doesn't tell Obi-Wan that Anakin is on Mustafar is because she believes that Obi-Wan is going there to kill him because Obi-Wan doesn't deny it when she asks him. But in this timeline, because of everything that's happening, Padme believes that Anakin is in trouble and that he needs help that she alone is not able to provide. And so, because of all this, in this timeline, Padme tells Obi-Wan and Ahsoka where Anakin is. Anakin had contacted me. He's on Sereno. I was about to leave to join Anakin to see if I can help him. But it's clear now. He needs more help than I can give. Padme confessed a mix of determination and apprehension in her voice. And also, believing that it would help, Padme also went on to tell Obi-Wan and Ahsoka about Anakin's visions of her dying and how Anakin is doing everything he's doing to prevent her death. This greatly surprised Obi-Wan and made him feel disappointed because Anakin did not come to him with this problem. Obi-Wan then thanked her and told Amidala that they, the Jedi, would soon go to Sereno and save Anakin. 
And then, despite initial objections from Obi-Wan and Ahsoka about the dangers she would face, Padme insisted on accompanying them to Sereno. Anakin needs me, she stated. And so, yielding to Padme's resolve, Obi-Wan and Ahsoka agreed to have her join them. Time was of the essence. Obi-Wan swiftly communicated their findings and plans to the Jedi Council. The revelations of Sidious's possible location on Sereno prompted immediate action. With the clone army now gone, the Jedi realized that their only really chance to end the war and restore peace to the Republic was to eliminate Sidious. And so the Council, understanding the stakes, rallied over a thousand Jedi to prepare for a mission to Sereno. If Sidious is killed, the war will end. He is the head of all this chaos, they concluded. And so the assembly of Jedi in Star Destroyers and Padme, Asoga, and Obi-Wan in a Naboo star skiff soon set off towards Sereno. Also, as part of their plan, it was decided that Padme, Obi-Wan, and Ahsoka would head on over to Sereno first, before the entire Jedi fleet entered the system. This plan was clear and calculated. Entering Sereno without drawing too much attention was crucial to verify Anakin and Sidious's presence. And upon exiting hyperspace in the Sereno system, Padme initiated communication with the planet's main spaceport, maintaining a guise of diplomatic visitation. A droid operator responded to Padme, and upon mentioning Anakin Skywalker, the droid forwarded the transmission to Anakin, who then provided coordinates on where to land to Padme. And with the coordinates set, the trio followed, steering their craft towards the given location, which ended up being a sprawling complex within what was once Kevin Dooku's castle. And meanwhile, as this was happening, Palpatine sensed a disturbance approaching, a precursor to a battle which was instigated by Anakin's action. And quickly finding Anakin in a control room, Palpatine inquired, What have you done, Lord Beta? And Anakin, with a mix of defiance and determination, replied, I called Padme here. We can help her better with her here rather than on Coruscant. So at this point, Padme, along with Obi-Wan and Ahsoka, are approaching the landing platform in Kevin Dooku's former castle. And Palpatine sensed that Obi-Wan and Ahsoka were with Padme. But Palpatine had anticipated a scenario where Anakin's personal connections might lead to vulnerabilities. He had prepared multiple contingencies, including quickly relocating to other bases, if necessary. And then Palpatine, realizing that Anakin doesn't know Obi-Wan and Ahsoka are with Padme, decided to use this development to his advantage, aiming to deepen Anakin's distrust towards the Jedi and even Padme. Very well, Lord Vader. Do what you must, Palpatine said, dismissing himself to prepare for their departure from Sereno, which Palpatine felt would soon be necessary. And soon after, as the Naboo star skiff landed, Anakin watching, Padme, Obi-Wan, and Ahsoka disembarked. Their appearance, especially that of Obi-Wan and Ahsoka, startling Anakin. But despite the shock, Padme's immediate rush towards him, asserting their intent to help, momentarily halted Anakin's train of thought. Anakin's initial argument that Obi-Wan sought his demise was quickly countered by Ahsoka's insistence that Palpatine was the manipulator here. She then shared what Maul told her about Anakin and Sidious, which Obi-Wan corroborated, emphasizing that their mission was Anakin's salvation, not condemnation. And Anakin, less swayed by the dark side and facing none of the heinous actions that mark his path in the original timeline, found it hard to view Obi-Wan and Ahsoka's threats to his life. Especially Ahsoka, his former apprentice. I will do what I must, Obi-Wan, to save Padme. That might be possible only through the dark side. Only through Sidious, Anakin stated, conflicted yet clinging to the belief in Sidious's promises. Obi-Wan responded earnestly, offering a beacon of hope through the vast knowledge housed within the Jedi archives, even its most hidden sections, to which Obi-Wan had access since he was a master. Anakin, if there is a way to save someone from death through the Force, I will help you find it. I will make sure access to the hidden archives are granted to you. Sidious is lying to you just like he did with Dooku and Maul. You know what happened to them both, because they follow Sidious. The dark side and Sidious's path can only lead to suffering, Anakin, Obi-Wan said. And at this pivotal moment, Padme pleaded with Anakin to abandon this dark path, urging him to leave with them back to Coruscant. And after hearing all this, Anakin, torn and confused, on his result wavering until Sidious re-entered the scene claiming that the Jedi's lies were merely a stalling tactic for an imminent attack by a Jedi fleet. After hearing this and looking at Obi-Wan, Anakin saw that Sidious was right. The realization that a vast Jedi force was indeed approaching Sereno sent Anakin spiraling further into turmoil. Who was truly deceiving him? What was the truth amidst this complex of lies, Anakin wondered. Sensing this moment of vulnerability in Anakin, Sidious again aimed to cement his influence over the Chosen One, exploiting his confusion and fear. 
and as tensions escalated, the CDSS manipulation and the imminent arrival of the Jedi fleet, Obi-Wan, seizing a moment of quiet amidst the storm, addressed Anakin with a sincerity that cut through the confusion. Anakin the fleet is coming but it is not for you. It's here to save the Republic from the Separatists and Sidious, Obi-Wan explained calmly. And then, demonstrating his commitment to peace and trust, Obi-Wan did something unexpected. He took out his lightsaber and threw it aside. A gesture quickly mirrored by Ahsoka. We are not here to fight, Anakin, Obi-Wan continued, his voice steady and sure. We, the Council, understands that you are not yourself when you chose to side with Sidious. I blame myself for not being there when you needed me for guidance. None of this was truly your fault, Anakin. Obi-Wan's plea was heartfelt, an open invitation for Anakin to see the truth. And at this moment, Anakin turned away from both Obi-Wan and Palpatine and looked at his wife. And as he looked into Padme's eyes, any lingering doubt vanished. The trust and history he shared with Obi-Wan, Ahsoka, and Padme spoke louder than any of Sidious's manipulations. He knew them well enough to recognize the sincerity in their eyes. They were here out of concern and love, ready to support him in finding his way back. This was the truth, Anakin saw it now. And with this newfound clarity, Anakin faced Palpatine. You need to surrender to the Republic. You'll be given a fair trial, Anakin declared, his voice resolute. Sidious coughed, incredulous, but Anakin, igniting his lightsaber, stood his ground. Stand down, he commanded. There is no other way, for either of us, Anakin said. And realizing at this point that Anakin has now turned against him, as quickly as he did against Master Windu, Palpatine quickly recalibrated his strategy. Seeing that retaining Anakin's loyalty at this moment was impossible, given how the Jedi fleet would soon be upon them, Palpatine decided to retreat, planning to topple the Republic from one of his many other bases, and later capture Anakin Skywalker and keep him prisoner for Palpatine's ultimate goal of transferring his spirit into Anakin's body. So side note, this technique of transferring one's spirit into another's body was known as essence transfer which was a Sith technique lost centuries prior to Palpatine's time, which he hoped to rediscover. Anyways, back to the story. After Anakin finished saying what he said, Palpatine responded. So be it, Jedi, he said, launching a devastating force push that sent everyone staggering back. And by the time they recovered, Palpatine had vanished. And Anakin, not wanting Sidious to get away since Sidious could control the Supper destroyed army against the Republic, and also, since he still wanted information that Sidious could provide on keeping someone from dying, Anakin pursued Sidious. Racing towards the direction, Palpatine had fled. And after Anakin ran after Sidious, Obi-Wan and Ahsoka did the same, after recovering their lightsabers and making sure that Padme was alright. Ahsoka then told Padme to wait there until they returned with Anakin. But Padme, extremely worried for Anakin at this point, didn't want to sit around and wait and wanted to do what she can to help Anakin. And so, she too followed Obi-Wan and Ahsoka, with her Naboo royal pistol in hand. And right at this moment, the Jedi fleet also arrived in the Sereno system. And as Padme saw, Star Destroyers had now entered Sereno's atmosphere, with Jedi exiting them on shuttles. And as for Anakin Skywalker, he pursued Darth Sidious, driven by a renewed sense of justice and a desperate need to rectify his mistakes. And Sidious, aware of the impending arrival of the Jedi fleet, had been preparing to flee Sereno to continue his diabolical scheme from another location. And as Anakin closed in, Sidious, sensing the need to at least temporarily incapacitate Anakin before making his escape, ignited his red bladed lightsaber, confronting Anakin with a chilling calm as his ship prepared to take off. You cannot escape your destiny, Lord Beta. Join me, and together we can rule the galaxy, Sidious taunted trying to manipulate Anakin's resolve one last time. And Anakin, with his blue lightsaber aglow, retorted with determination. Surrender, Sidious. It is the only way out of this. But Sidious, of course, did not listen and engaged Skywalker in an intense duel. The duel was a sight to behold, with Sidious employing his mastery of all seven forms of lightsaber combat, channeling his aggression and tapping into the dark side's raw power. Anakin, on the other hand, relied on Form 5, demonstrating his strength and counter attacks, but notably not drawing on the dark side here. This restraint, while noble, left him at a power disadvantage. And then, as the duel went on, with Sidious feeling the pressure of time and Anakin's unexpected prowess escalated his attacks, his movements becoming more unpredictable and ferocious. Anakin, focused and resolute, managed to parry and counter most of Sidious' strikes, but the Sith Lord's power was immense. And as the battle went on, Sidious attempted to unleash a torrent of force lightning to subdue Anakin and make his escape. However, 
Anakin Srolala's assault left no opening for such a maneuver, and growing desperate, Sidious's attacks became even more aggressive, fully succumbing to the dark side's influence, his actions now fueled by sheer instinct rather than the calculated strategy he had in mind. And then, at a critical moment, Anakin's focus wavered. Sensing Pathme along with Obi-Wan and Ahsoka approaching, for a second, Anakin's attention went to them. And this split-second distraction allowed the dark side to guide Sidious's lightsaber right through Anakin's defenses and into his chest. Sidious had not intended to fatally wound Anakin, but in the heat of the moment, he had delivered a fatal strike onto Lord Vader. But as quickly as this happened, Palpatine told himself that if Skywalker was so easily defeated, then he was of no use. And that, with Skywalker's death, the prophecy of the Chosen One was proven to be a lie believed by the Jedi Council. And then, as Anakin fell to his knees, his lightsaber extinguished, Sidious approached Skywalker, taking a moment to observe the dying Chosen One, just as he had observed Plagueis as he had died. Ahsoka, Obi-Wan, and Batme, who had been separated from Anakin due to the confusing nature of Count Dooku's castle, would take some more time before they got to where Sidious was and his ship would also take a few moments before it could take off. So Sidious had a few moments to spare, to observe how Skywalker's Midichlorians behaved as they died. But this proved to be an act of grave mistake, and that's because, in a final act of defiance and quick thinking, Anakin called his lightsaber to his hand, he ignited it, and thrust it through Sidious's neck, catching the Sith Lord in a moment of vulnerability a millisecond before he could react. And so Sidious died, his body crumbling to the floor, next to Anakin's own crumbling form. And so, in his final moments, Anakin had fulfilled the prophecy of the Chosen One. He destroyed the Sith and brought balance to the Force. And then, as the life inside Anakin lingered, he saw the blurry forms of Obi-Wan, Ahsoka, and Padme approaching him. And looking at Obi-Wan, Anakin said the following, Save her, Obi-Wan. And then, after taking one last look at Ahsoka and then Padme, Anakin closed his eyes forever. But right as Anakin died, he heard a familiar voice, one that he hadn't heard in over a decade. And as for what happened to the Clone Wars minus the Clone Wars at this point, well, with Sidious gone, the Separatist command structure crumbled. And even though the clones were gone, due to their new alliance with the Mandalorians, thanks to Ahsoka helping Bo-Katan defeat Maul, the Mandalorians blessed allegiance to the Jedi, at least temporarily. They owed them that. And so, the almost 10,000 Jedi and the many Mandalorians combined to take down the Separatist forces. This took some time, but eventually, without a solid command structure, the Separatist forces fell, and the Separatist leaders sought for peace. And as for Lokalea, they were born. And Padme did not die, due to Anakin's actions in this timeline. And eventually, Padme gave Lokalea to the Jedi Order, where they grew up, powerful in the Force. And as for what happened after that, well, that's up to you. Maybe Darth Jar Jar intervened. Anyways, that is it for this video, I hope you enjoyed, and if you did, and if you have the time, do check out my Patreon, link is in the description, where for $1 or more a month, I think, you can get early access to my videos, a shout out in all videos, and some exclusive content which I will be posting there, I hope. I will. Anyways, have a good day, stay hydrated, and goodbye.